Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful tech leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode was brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Carolina Toth here. Welcome to the Level Up Engineering Podcast. My guest today is the author of 4.2 books, three of which he has also published, and an accomplished tech leader, having helped many teams, including Pinterest and Slack, grow into the companies that they are today. So he has a blog and a podcast and built an engaged online community under the side, under the pen name of Rands. Welcome, Lop. Um, please tell us a bit about um, your passions. My passion. Oh, what a good question. Um, well, it's people mostly, but I guess the, the proper way to describe that is is leadership. Long ago, when I worked at Netscape, I didn't really see any sort of literature that was helpful to me as an engineer in terms of developing as a leader. So I, I started just to talk to people and find good ideas and eventually start writing them even before it was a blog and what was a blog. So it was really gratifying to see as these were ideas were shared that people were like, cool, this is useful. And this is, speaks to me. So my passion is really sort of learning and figuring out how to, how to do this craft of leadership. So I love doing that. That's awesome. And it seems like you have built quite a career out of it. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a very specific question for you. As I was preparing to talk to you, yeah. I joined your Slack community about re- mm-hmm. leadership and um, I had the chance to participate in one of the happy hours organized for <laughs> my time zone. Of course, I bragged to the guys about uh, having the chance to meet you and um, they said, I wonder if he considers himself very famous, which was <laughs> an explanation that I was unfamiliar with. So I asked, you know, what's very famous? And they said, it's someone who is famous in Silicon Valley. Um, and so I had promised them that I will ask you this question. <laughs> I understand what is being asked. I generally kind of bristle a little bit when someone says, are you famous? Not bristle. It's I'm just a guy who uh, writes a lot and um, has been recognized for that. I think the word famous has a lot of, <laughs> and I know this is not what you're suggesting. There's some negative connotations to it that I'm not interested in. And so I'm noteworthy. I'm uh, known for doing things, but the the famous or world famous, that's the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> I'm just some schmo who likes to write things down. And as my wife says, you just kind of get things done when I want to choose to do something. I'm like, cool, I, I think there's this really good idea about, you know, I think I can use Slack to build a leadership community. And then I just do it for five years. And I'm like, oh, cool, it worked out. And by the way, a lot of those things that I do don't happen, but I'm not famous. I just like to get things done. And I do like back to your first question, I like to figure out how to help people and how to kind of collectively learn from each other because that's how you get better. Awesome. I totally agree with you. (laughs) So perhaps not surprisingly, today's topic is um, engineering leadership. And I want to say, let's just jump right into it. What were some of the biggest leadership challenges of your career? The classic one that I talk about a lot is really sort of the, the reason for the first book, Managing Humans, it was this sort of switch that happens when you're sort of a productive engineer, a builder, and then for whatever reason, however it happens, you get kind of thrust into this management or this leadership role. And you believe that the things that made you a good engineer are going to make you a good leader. And that's just not true at all. And when you combine that with the factors, at least for me, there was not a lot of support in terms of like becoming a leader. They're like, figure it out, YOLO. So that was the biggest challenge for me was, what should I be doing here? How do I do this well? And not having a lot of structure. I mean, finding people over time and, and learning things the hard way. But the, the hard part was sort of like relearning sort of the skills I needed to be successful after a reasonably successful career as an engineer. And it's like I say, it's like it's a career restart. And you just you're not prepared for that. And no one really tells you that when you become a leader. So. The biggest challenge was just like, how do I 
do this job well, when there's not a lot of support, there's not a lot of, of at least back then, community around um, getting better at it. So that was the first big hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. You have written a few books. Uh, in one of your podcasts, uh, you also mentioned that uh, one of the things that one shouldn't do when writing a book is go into a bookstore, because then <laughs> you see all the other books that are out there on the topics that you chose. <laughs> I was curious, when you were starting out as an engineering manager, how did you start? Did you find some heroes that you wanted to ask, some mentors, or did you go to the bookstore, or did you just yeah. try to go ahead and um, do it? Yeah, it was finding leaders that I respected and just sort of indexing on them and watching how they worked. And I think perhaps even more importantly, being really mindful of how they're doing things it's just sort of seeing especially when times are tense and people are look kind of you know freaking out and kind of doing things what are the moves that they use and it's like it's simple things it's the way they frame a sentence when everyone's mad or when there's tension in the room how they diffuse it when there's people that want to get a word in, ed word in edgewise and they can't, how do they encourage those folks that are perhaps more quiet? So it's really just being super aware of your surroundings, especially around those leaders that you admire. So I'm, I am a collection of dozens of different leaders that I've, I've looked at and gone, oh my God, that totally speaks to me the way that you did this. Or So not a lot of reading, not a lot of books around leadership. It's more a lived experience of of seeing people and how they work. I had this really nice compliment from someone I work with a while ago. And he said, he's like, the best part of, I just like watching you work. I like to see how you do things. That's how I'm learning. And yes, Lop, you like to like say things, but like the more important thing is when we see how you're actually treating people or how you're making decisions and that sort of thing. So hopefully I'm doing that same thing that others did for me over the, and it's continue to do for me, by the way, in terms of like, seeing their moves and how their values are explained by their actions. So it's, it's watching other leaders. Wow. Um, <laughs> so my question is kind of related to this, but kind of related to your own experience. Mm -hmm. Our listeners are engineering managers, mostly. And mm -hmm. I am sure that we would ask you, what's the most important thing that you have learned about <laughs> leadership um, and it sounds kind of simplistic but when it yeah. comes from someone like you it might be you know what's the one thing that you want to point out this has changed over the years because i get asked this i get asked this a lot but it's changed because I, I as i evolve i kind of see sort of what is the most important thing and to me I'm more of an executive now than sort of a frontline manager, so so a different perspective. But it still is something that I would wish I could have told frontline first-time manager Michael Lopp back at Netscape a million years ago. But it really is about that ability to delegate, which is hard. A delegation, this this task that has been this big task that's been given to you, taking that and, and giving it to someone else on your team, you not doing the actual work, you giving it maybe chunking it up into different tasks and then giving it to other folks. It's a fundamentally hard thing, especially for engineers to do, because we like building things. We like banging on the keyboards and creating things. And now what you're telling me is that I have to do this thing, but I don't get to do any of the work. I actually, and by the way, there's tons of work, but the perceived work of like banging on the keyboards or doing the testing or doing the performance, whatever it is. So that ability to kind of give up your Legos, give them to other people and let them do the work, which sounds like I'm like giving away all my things. There's plenty for me to do every single day, but my job isn't the work. My job is to build a, a group of talented humans who we can scale and get all the work done in lots of interesting ways while growing them, while having a successful business. So, but that's the thing. I see it a lot in new managers. When usually when the sky falls, they like their reaction is, well, I'll code and help. And it's like, no, it's literally the opposite of what you should be doing now. You should be 100% not coding. You should be figuring out how to empower others or teach others or coach others to get through whatever this crisis is. And when I see it, it's, it's one of my tests for like future directors, sort of managers of managers is have I seen them with my eyeballs do something, a huge project where they didn't do anything. 
actually like the coding piece or like that. They literally help the team get the thing done. So that's the biggest one. That's delegation piece is really a powerful lesson for all of us to think about because it's it's about influencing others, guiding others, coaching others to get the work done as opposed to doing it yourself. So that's is a good it answer. like a, like a shift in your values when you say you know like the work is. That you do is yeah. also work. It's just not yeah. the same as banging on the, the values laptop. is it's a it's a good word. It is there's something about values, but it's also just sort of it's understanding that the act of delegating is actually work. Like your value of that you have in yourself as an engineer is like, did I write the code? Did I finish the feature? Did I close the bugs? Whatever it is. Those are very tangible things. And it's uncomfortable when you get into these more abstract leadership concepts of, of delegation or influence or whatever it is. But you have to learn that that is there's work there and there's value in that. And that's the, that's one of the hardest parts of these when you're managing humans is that you've got this like end of the day, you're like, what did I do today? I'm like I had eight meetings, but like, what did I actually produce? And here's the thing. Did a ton. You helped the team understand a thing. You made a decision about X. You did all these things. Like it really did. You don't have a bug that you can look at and see that you closed, or a code that you, a piece of code that you checked in. But that all still happened, and you have to sort of convince yourself that you don't have to convince. You have to learn that that is valuable work. So, if it comes to that, um, how do we know mm. that we are mm. a good leader? If, if <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, one behavior is being a good delegator, yeah. if that's a word. Yeah. But yeah. Um, when we see people, we know, you know, we like someone who is a good leader, we trust in them, um, whatever it may be. But how do we know of ourselves? What traits do we have to notice on ourselves to know that we are being yeah, good? It's, yeah, it's a good question. There's it's sort of situational, right? There's different situations that require different kinds of leaders. There's, there's a situation where you really do want someone who's just a dictator and kind of just driving us forward. And that, that I would never do that. That sounds horrible to me, but it's, there's situations where you want that, right? And there's situations where you want more of a, a team builder, more of the sort of a human focused leader. So that's number one is understanding like, what is the situation that you're in and sort of like, what leader do I need to be here? And then, once you know that, which is hard, there's, I just did this recently because I started a new gig. I just went through for myself, I went through each of my teams and I said, in a year, what would I like to see? And some of these things, what would I like to see for this team? And sometimes it's product stuff, sometimes it's team stuff. And those are my OKRs or goals or whatever you want to call them. Those are my sort of measures for myself. And some of those are very subjective, very like me kind of going, uh, it's a feel thing. And some of them are very objective, like, did we ship this? Did we hit this metric? That sort of thing. But I will likely share those with my team via whatever sort of performance management process we end up using. But they were really for me to kind of say, okay, cool. I know enough of what I've gotten into right now. And I know, I want to know the three things that I want to do. And, you know, uh, nine months from now, I'll go back and look at those and see, okay, cool. Like, (laughs) how did I predict what I needed to do? Because some of those predictions are wrong. But also for the ones that were right, like, how did I do on those things? So that's one thing. There's another thing which is tangential to this, which is your team is going to tell you how you're doing and you have to listen when they tell you and i'm talking about your manager or your peers or the folks that work for you like they're telling you all the time believe it or not and sometimes it's recency bias and sometimes it's sort of like people are mad because of this one thing and you got to like not take it personally when it's like that day when (laughs) you screwed up and they're uh, like this is sucked you got to kind of look at it like holistically But they tell you all the time, this is something just getting off a little bit on a different topic. People are always like, when is our performance management cycle? Like, when am I going to get feedback? If you work for me, you're getting feedback all the time because (laughs) this, this idea that like you do it once a year or every six months is absurd. The world is always, your team is always telling you how you're doing. And sometimes you need to be explicit and say, do you have any feedback for me? And they have to be willing to tell you, which is an interesting test all by itself. But like, 
I'm always listening for how I'm doing. And sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's political. And I'm like, why do you think that? And I have like work to do to kind of change your perception. But like uh, my great, my, my report card's constantly coming in. <laughs> so I kind of hear a similarity in that you said, you know, when you were beginning on this path, you, right. you kind of had to pay attention to your peers. Yeah. And now you are again, to me, saying that you have to pay attention constantly to to the Always. people yeah i just wrote this book this comes out in one of the which is a chapter that i wrote for the blog but it's it's one of the most important skills that i think a, a manager needs to learn which is reading the room i think it's a poker term but it's just when you walk into a situation it's like okay what's going on here who's at this table with me what do i know about them blah blah, blah. it's exhausting by the way especially over like you know <laughs> zoom or google hangouts in this new world that we're in right now but uh you're really you have to be aware of what's going on around you because that's you're dependent on these people to get things done if they're mad at you that's one situation if they're not willing to engage with you that's another situation but it's that situational awareness that is incredibly important to kind of understand where you're at because complex groups of people that move in strange complex ways and you got to be aware of those changes right so we mentioned delegation we mentioned reading the room what are some of your practices to develop your leadership skills i think this is like a book that i could answer here um <laughs> go ahead <laughs> well there literally is a book that's a new book that's coming out it's sort of like these small things that i'm doing every day but i think i want to kind of synthesize that a little bit to me, I'm always kind of working on something. I've always got a, a habit or a thing that I am improving. It's just this idea that like you're fully formed as a leader is not true ever. It's just like you're never fully formed as a human. So one of my practices, I'm always kind of like, cool, I'm kind of bad at this. And I'm, I want to get in a habit of like fixing this this thing about me, whether that's how I communicate or how I keep track of things or whatever it is. And, and right now it's actually, it's back to one I've done 10 times, which is sort of task management. I'm back on this. I've been on it 10 times before this, but I'm like, I'm in a new org and a new sort of culture. So it's, there's so many things to do that my current task management system isn't sufficient. It needs to scale. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to do that? So I'm working on that. And it's not about it is about task management, but it's also about, for me as a leader, am I perceived as reliable? Like if you ask me to do something and I say, yes, I'll do that. Do you trust immediately that that is going to always happen? And that's like a big deal. Like when you, your boss or your manager or your peer, when you're like, I trust them, they're going to get the things done. That is a perception. I want to be viewed that way, but that means also means that I have the operational like fortitude to kind of get everything done. And right now it's a little bit challenging. So always be learning i think is probably the short answer to your question <laughs> um, <laughs> what are, what um, if we if we want to get into some like actual like hard tips for our yeah. listeners let's talk about for example this time management perspective yeah what what are some of the things that you can recommend to us that have yeah helped it's you? i mean it's for me and i'm different than you and different than a lot of your listeners but like I always like I'm sitting here right now at my desk in my office and I right in front of me, I have my notebook. And um, if this is a regular meeting, that notebook would be open and I would have a pen right there. And any time anybody says anything remotely that sounds like it to do, um, I just write it down. And it's sometimes it's for me. Sometimes it's just a thing I want to know, but I just write it down like these notebooks get filled. I can fill fill one of them in a day. So capture everything. And then at the end of the day, I'm looking at my calendar right now. I have a chunk of time where I just go through and I go back and I go through that. I'm like, okay, it's now, you know, one or to eight hours later. What are the things I must do? What are the things I'm like, uh, probably not. And by the way, it changes. Like something feels really important when you say, well, can you do this thing? And at the end of the day, I'm like, this is just not important at all. But that doesn't mean that I don't say, hey, by the way, I'm not going to do this. I heard this in the meeting this morning. Da, da. So there's still a follow up, even though I'm not going to do the thing anymore. So, but anyway, there's a sort of synthesis of everything and capturing it somewhere where I go look at it. And it's right now, and this is not the perfect system. I'm doing a little bit of inside of Slack because I used to be the VP of engineering Slack. I'm using Slack, the sidebar, as sort of a, a tracking system. Like 
a DM that I'm going to keep or a project that I'm concerned about. I'm using that as sort of a reminder. I'm also using um, things right now as a task tracking. I'm not sure if I'm going to end up there, but just as sort of my personal sort of set of things that don't really fit in the channel, I'm, I'm using that. But I think the important part of what I'm talking about is the consistency of always being in listening mode, capturing the to do's or the thoughts and every day going through at the end of the day, kind of just cleaning it up, kind of calling out things that aren't important. And that's just part of my day. I do it every single day. It's easy when I say it like that, but it's hard when, you know, <laughs> every day, five o'clock, okay, I'm going to go through everything here. And it's sometimes I'm like tired, but I got to get it done because my job as a leader, I'm a, I'm a nexus of a lot of things. And if I'm not perceived as reliable, then people are going to start going around me. People are going to start trying to figure ways to like, game the system and like I'm the system you shouldn't have to game me <laughs> <laughs> it, it almost sounds like you have to be really justly introspective I, I don't know yeah if that's what it made me yeah made me think about also really um humble as well like it's a position of power that you're in as a leader and everyone knows that you're a leader and to me there's a they know that you are have decision making authority or whatever it is and you've got to respect that respect they have for you as well, which is why like if I'm perceived as unreliable, that's not just like me as a human, that's like leadership at my company is unreliable. That's super bad. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. So if we are at this relationship with your peers and, and with yeah. your teams, how do you influence your teams? How do you influence people to be more productive or do what right. the business is asking them to do? There's different approaches that are different on different teams, but my approach, um, and I'm doing this right now, is I have a lot of teams that are outside of my world where I, I'm dependent on them. And it starts with just relationship building with these other folks, bridge building, as I call it, where these are teams in different parts of the company that have different, completely different goals than perhaps I do. How do I make it such that they know that I want to work with them. I am dependent on them and they're dependent on me in, in a not weird way. There's sort of these formative moments that you want to have with these other teams where you're like, cool, we're all in this together. We have a, a set of shared goals about what things we want to do. Even though we perhaps are not on the same team, we, we are on the same team. We're all in this together. So how do you build that relationship with different teams when they have perhaps different values or, or different cultures? Because I work at a big company now. So it's a lot of bridge building that I'm doing because when it comes, push comes to shove and there's like a hard thing to do and I need something out of a team and I have a hard ask for them, which is not necessarily something they have on their schedule or something they're, what are they going to do when I come in and say, hey, so-and-so, can you help me with this thing here? They're going to be like, okay, how do I value this person and the team that he works with? It's like, it's important to me. And not in a weird way, but important. This, this really, team is important to me. So I'm going to figure out how to get this thing done relative to all the other things I have to do. It's a it's a value judgment that they're making. And even if the answer is no, like they're going to say, Lop, sorry, we thought about it all this way. And it's no, we can't do this. I can tell in the no that there's respect there, that they're like, they thought about it and they did their best, right? So to me, this act of influencing is starts with just really sort of building credible professional relationships with all those folks around you and it, it sounds easy when i say it like that it's not <laughs> it, it's it, <laughs> you've got to do it a lot you got to do a lot different humans need sort of to see different things to kind of build trust and it takes time so i don't know does that answer your question kind of are are your teams <laughs> always allowed to say no to you in any situation <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> right it's a powerful thing there's this moment, I keep on talking about this story, but I'll say it again. There's this moment where if you have one-on-ones with me, one of the things I do in one-on-ones most of the time is I, when at the end of the one-on-one, I say, especially right when we get started as a, as a new team, I'm like, do you have any feedback for me? And never in the history of ever has anyone told the VP or the director feedback in their first one-on-one. -on -one. They're like, no, no, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Right. And then I keep on doing it every week and they keep on not saying anything. And then like a month later, they realize I'm not going to stop. So they say something and it's maybe a small something or it's a big something. But it's like to me, I don't even, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. 
it's the fact that they chose to do it and they felt safe and they trusted me enough to say, hey, Lop, you screwed up this thing. And I'm like, great, that's awesome, thank you. It's the same thing as no. When someone says, I say, hey, well, blah, 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 really wants to do this. I think it's important, here's why. And they're like, no. And I'm like, cool, awesome. <laughs> tell me why. And they're like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that makes complete sense. I retract my request. Or I go, well, that totally is unreasonable. Here's why. And we have a debate. And then suddenly the no sometimes turns to yes. But to me, it's it's just good communication when someone says no. If they're just being a jerk and just saying no because they don't like me, then that's a whole other situation that I have failed as a leader to build a rapport where we can have good communication. But no is really good news, right? No is like signal, truth coming to you from someone who probably has more data than you about whatever the situation is. So it's kind of a joy. I mean, it's sometimes a drag when you're like, oh my God, we got to do this thing and everyone, no one wants to do it. And they're all saying no. Okay, why are they all saying no? Like, do they, do they know something we don't? The people that are asking for this thing? Like when people say no to me, I'm like, great cool. We are now communicating as regular old humans. <laughs> All right. So now that we've kind of went into this direction, yeah, yeah. what are some of the mistakes that you have seen in leadership? Mm -hmm. I think one we've kind of already went over it a little bit is sort of this belief that like management is this higher power like you have some magical set of skills because someone decided to make you a manager or a leader it's just a different role it's a different set of skills there's perhaps some more responsibility because you're responsible for growing the team and you know signing the paychecks or this sort of thing but the folks that kind of get lost in the power of the role and i, I have done this in the past i don't, hopefully don't do this anymore that's that's a common mistake another one is that I do and continue to do, but try to get better at is thinking that what I'm saying is so clear that you're always hearing it so well, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I still do this where I'm like, well, uh, say my three sentences and I look up at the room and it's this, I'm like, it's crickets. I'm like, why is not everyone getting exactly what I'm saying in these three well written? And it was like two or three words in those sentences that were just kind of confusing. And everyone didn't get it. So like, thinking that because you're the leader that people just automatically understand what you're saying. I screw this up daily. It's one of the, it's one of the reasons I always ask, does that make sense? Or, da, 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 or like whenever I sense sort of a little bit of confusion, I'm like, can, can you repeat back what you just heard me say? So that, that communication piece being, um, getting the clarity of communication is another thing I screw up a lot. Other mistakes of leaders. I don't know. We could do this all day. <laughs> I think the other one is, is, again, a theme that we've talked about is just it's around no, is like waiting till the least opportune time to actually give the critical feedback around performance time. Uh, new managers especially, are, it's hard for them to, to tell a, maybe even someone that used to be a peer, like someone, hey, by the way, this is a suboptimal way that you did this. It's hard feedback. And so people, humans, generally wait until they're forced to say something like around performance time when dollars and compensation is there that's the least opportune time to say that because they're not thinking about the feedback they're thinking about the dollars they're thinking about the consequence of this feedback and and maybe it's the first time they've heard it and they're like excuse me this why, why did i not hear this all year so kind of holding back and the, saying the hard thing until you're like someone's requiring you to do it that's a huge mistake and also by the way a super good way to erode trust on a team because suddenly everyone's like waiting every six months to when the green reaper shows up to tell them how it's going that's just horrible um i, I could list things like this for like an hour or two <laughs> but those All are right. some of the ones that pop to mind do you mind if i go back a little bit when you said sure. you often say what did you hear of what I said yeah. to yeah, yeah. to a team or a group of people. How do you, I don't know if I am phrasing this correctly, but but uh, bear with me. So, so how do you build your brand? Do you actually care <laughs> about these things? Or, or is it just like, you know, this is who I am. I am Renz, I am Lop, I, yeah, I, yeah. I do what I do or. It's a really good question. It's a subtle question. If, if building my brand allows me 
to kind of do my job better, then I'm interested in that. That's one thing. So like this Slack community, it's got like 13,000 people in it. Was that a brand building exercise? It, it's certainly happening because of that. That wasn't the point. The point was, cool, if I can get a lot of leaders together and allow them, provide a safe place for them to teach each other, is that good? And like, that's super good, right? That's like amazing. And you, it sounds like you're there. There's like, I don't know how many thousands of channels in there. I play this game now where I'm like, cool. I wonder if anyone's talking about like AWS bills. And of course, there's like three AWS channels with like hundreds of people in there literally talking about the question that I have right now or in the last week or so so brand building exercise or just trying to build things of value there's the, both are happening but it's not the core thing is not the brand the other thing if you go look at sort of my career i've tended to pick companies that are notable apple slack pinterest palantir uh, netscape borland going way back there and brand is he picking brand name companies maybe but that's not how i viewed it at the time to me it's like these are interesting impactful companies that i can smell are either going to do something or have done something there so and i know when i'm going into them well i'm going to learn a ton here there's going to be something going on here whether it's for the past three companies i've been at like growing an engineering organization quickly or back at apple the first time i was at apple um sort of like what do I need to know about design as an engineer? These are all things where it's it's perhaps selfish, but I'm like, I know that I'm going to learn a ton. So and does that part of brand too as well? Do I, am I picking name brand companies? Maybe, or am I just picking ones that are going to be interesting to me? So there's not a deliberate branding exercise going on in my head. It's, it's happening and it's, it exists, but that's not the primary thing I'm focused on. All right. As I am talking to leaders, this is a question that um, that has come up a few times. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, it's a it's a very harsh difference when you become an engineering manager yeah. in the first um, part of your career. What should a new engineering manager do when they feel overwhelmed with their new position or or? with what they are doing or with the number of their tasks? The thing that they think is probably going to, that they're not supposed to do. And sorry, this is like, a, one of my former directors calls me the king of the short answer. I'll tell you what the answer is to your question. Ask for help. <laughs> oh my God. Like it's, but it's weird because you giggle at that probably because it seems like, it seems obvious, but it's also like, it's not the thing that you do when you're feeling overwhelmed especially as a leader, because you're supposed to know what's going on and have the plan. And you're like, uh, there's too much to do. I don't know how to prioritize this, blah, blah, blah. But, but you get asked for help, like in any direction, ask your boss, ask your peers, ask your team. It's a powerful moment when you're like overwhelmed and you go to your team and say like, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to get this all done. Can you help me kind of think through these things? I did this literally yesterday. I was talking with someone going like this, I, cannot figure out how to frame this program. Can I just walk you through it? And can you tell me what you think? And this is a brand new manager. He's never done anything like what I'm talking about. And it was 30 minutes of absolute gold for me. He's like, that seems like really overly complicated. And I'm like, you're right. Why would I do that? Right. <laughs> Asking for help. And like, I'm like, I'm Rands. I've got this brand, blah, blah, blah. And this frontline manager that I'm working with is he's like, why is he asking me? And it's, it's, I just want, I want a different perspective on this thing. And I'm just, I need help on this thing that I'm working on. So by the way, it's relationship building, it's bridge building, all the things we've been talking about. Um, but it's just asking for help and knowing that like, you're not in this alone and whatever that thing is, that's overwhelming you or set of likely set of things, a little bit of perspective, a little bit of other, of diversity of perspective is going to give you, it's going to help you out there. And by the way, <laughs> you're asking for help. That's like, People love that. They want to help, like in general, right? And it, it lowers your status if you're asking your you know, peers or your team as like, this is a regular human being who gets overwhelmed like everybody does on the planet, by the way. And it's, it's, it's a humanizing moment as well. So when I'm overwhelmed, I do other things. But one of the things I do is I go to someone I trust and I'm like, can you help me with this? Because <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> 
the baseline is our listeners should not be mm-hmm. afraid for their status or afraid mm-hmm. for being perceived as um, less of a good manager if they ask for help. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Let's go back to the beginning a little bit because we have a few more minutes and I want to sure. squeeze the most of our time. We were talking about delegation in the beginning and um, now we were talking yeah. about asking for help. What are some of your tips for delegating in a useful way? <laughs> well, it's a good question. The number one is doing it in the first place, which should be obvious. Um, <laughs> so remember that when you're delegating something, one of the things that one of the exercises that people put themselves through is they're like, this project comes to them. And they're like, I know how to do this. I'm going to get an A on this because I've done this many times before. So I should do it. And the answer is no, you shouldn't. You should delegate because you've been listening to LOP. When you're giving that project to your to your manager or to your team, you need to give them the ability to do the project and not to be like super prescriptive about like every step of the thing. And by the way, you, you know how to get an A because you've done it before. So you could literally say, do this, do this, do this, do this. There's situations that perhaps if it's a critical thing, you do that, but you want them to learn like whatever it is, the lessons that you learned when you did this before, you want them to learn. So there's a certain amount of like give them space to fail and not enough space to like have it collapse, but at least to try some things, because by the way, they may think of a better way than you. And if you're sitting there saying it's this, it's this, it's this, then you're you're squelch you're, you're you're stomping out their ability to actually go and learn. So the question, the needle you have to thread is like, how much room am I going to give them to work on this, and how much how much space to get them to kind of like figure out how they, to do this on themselves. And by the way, it does mean that when they do it, perhaps they only get a B. Like it's not the A that you would have gotten when you did it. B is great. A B is amazing for the first time for a big project. And by the way, they learned how to do the things and they saw you delegating to them. So trust is higher. So it's giving them that space. Again, I'm not saying like completely being hands off. Like you want to keep track of what's going on and kind of see like, whoa, 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 that's going to blow up. Let me tell you why. So you got to figure out how to kind of like give them space to do it, allow them to be successful, but also most importantly let them learn as they're going through this i mean you can tell them everything but if you're anything like me you tell me this is how it's gonna go i kind of believe you when i fail and i go oh geez that screwed up and you and uh, you were right i I believe you a lot more (laughs) not that you have to fail to learn obviously you can learn by being successful too but you got to go through that sort of critical like learning cycle and that means not just reading from a script that your boss gave you. Awesome. We have covered a lot of things. Um, <laughs> and I think there is some good hard tips there that we can put to use good. like tomorrow. Excellent. Is there anything important regarding leadership that we have mm-hmm. not covered and you feel like you have to share with the world? I think the last thing I'll say is, and you said it a little earlier, there's a self-awareness thing that you have to, be as a leader you have to know what you're good at and where you need to grow and it doesn't matter who you are as a leader there's definitely places where you have strengths and definitely places you have weaknesses and we don't like to talk about the weaknesses because they're weaknesses and you're sort of embarrassed that you're not as good as that this thing than you are at these other things but when i'm when i'm doing interviews i'm looking for that self-awareness do you have that ability because no one's perfect like on the planet at all. And if you have that ability to know, cool, I'm great at X, but I'm not so great at B, you have an advantage over the person who's like, I'm great at X and I want to be great at B, so I'm going to work on it and I'm going to overvalue my ability there and that's going to somehow blow up for me as I'm getting a thing done. As opposed to, I'm good at X, I'm kind of bad at B, which means I'm going to hire someone to be great at B, who I know is going to be awesome. I'm going to delegate to someone who is great at B. So there's that self-awareness piece and being just being truthful with yourself about who you are and what your abilities are that I think is important. There's a lot of 
I think, again, this is a recurring theme from our conversation. There's a lot of like, well, I'm the boss, so I have, I must be right. And I'm, and I, what I'm saying is the law. God, this is horrible. Every sentence I say is awful, but I like, that's no, it's not at all. You're in this empowering job to like uh, level up others, to do things at scale and to learn together. So self-awareness, I think is probably the other thing I'd throw out there. And just to pick your mind about this, do you think that people should, um, first of all, work on their greatest or what they perceive as their greatest weaknesses? Or do you think it's more beneficial to work on things that you're already good at or talented at and, um, mm -hmm. and just work with your strengths? It's a good question. I think, let me restate the question. You're not like, do people tend to work on the things they're good at or they tend to work on the things that they're bad at? Is or the should question? they? But yes. I mean, it's, it, the answer is a little bit of both. Like you should be like those things that you're, <laughs> I, I have managers who are like great at X and, but it's boring at them to do X because they're so good at it. <laughs> right. They're like, I've done this before. So, but I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're good at it. You should just do this. So you want to, <laughs> you, you want to be invested in both. You want to be those, those skills that are, you're, you're naturally good at. Yes. But I mean, there is an investment in those things where you need to be working, but it's both. It's a little bit of both. Um, I had this manager had a prior gig and she was had this project that was adrift and, <laughs> and I, I knew if she did this, that she could do it in her sleep and it wasn't going to be like a huge, like stretch for her because she I've seen her do it before but she signed up to do it and as soon as she did I'm like cool this year-long project is now done in my head because this person is doing it and I think she learned a lot but at the end of the day it was the right thing to do because we needed it and this person was amazing at this sort of thing so she chose her battle as well and then the next thing was perhaps a little bit more difficult a little different shape sort of exercise so you want to be doing a little bit a little bit of both but it, it's the awareness part that's the important part. The thing that you know where you have a gap because that's interesting to the business, but it's also interesting to you as a, as a place where you should focus on and work. All right. Thank you. Thank you for answering that as well. Um, Absolutely. We have talked about some of the things that you do. Where uh -huh. should our listeners go to follow your work? Uh, well, I have a I have a blog, as you mentioned at the beginning. It's called ransinrepose.com. It's been around for a couple of decades. But by far the most interesting thing to do is to uh, go to that blog and there's a way to join the Slack there. Just send me a mail and you can come to the Slack. If you're a leader, you can be with you, your 13,000 other leaders talking about this craft that we are have chosen to do. So, And also I've got a couple books. Um, I have Managing Humans and then I have another one called Being Geek. And there's another one coming out. I'm not sure when this is going to be posted, but coming out at the end of June called Small Things Done Well. So you can buy the book too, which captures a lot of things we're talking about. Awesome. Thank you. Is there anything else at all that you would like to add? It's a pandemic right now. Um, <laughs> it's an important time to be a good leader. I don't know. No, no I don't actually have anything to add. That makes sense, though. It, it does make sense. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Lop. Our guest today was Michael Lop, the blogger, a software engineering manager or executive, should I say, uh, <laughs> an accomplished author who is apparently always looking for new challenges and ways to grow. <laughs> That's um, true. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Dearest listeners, thanks for staying with us. I am Karolina Tot. This is Level Up Engineering, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com. <laughs>